Earlier this year, Nicholas Sandman sued the Washington Post over their characterization of his encounter with Native American Nathan Phillips in Washington, D.C. while he was on a school field trip. The images and articles from the Washington Post and other publications spread across social media and traditional media, and they were a massive commentary on the idea of white privilege and the oppression of Native peoples by a bunch of high school kids. The result of that lawsuit came swiftly and brutally for Sandman. A federal judge dismissed all of the causes of action against the Washington Post, basically stating that Sandman didn't bring a case in which the court could actually grant relief. But in a stunning turn of events, on October 28, 2019, that same federal judge came back and reversed part of his decision, allowing the lawsuit to go forward. So what the hell happened? Let's take a look. So it's important to start procedurally with what happened just yesterday for me, October 28th of 2019. Prior to this, the plaintiff, Nick Sandman, through his attorney, uh, filed a motion to the court asking for relief under Rule 60 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, under Rule 59 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, and asked for leave to file an amended complaint to rectify the deficiencies that caused the dismissal. Rule 60 is basically request for relief from a judgment uh, due to error or omission or some other thing. Um, this can span the whole gambit of clerical errors by the court clerk to errors uh, or omissions of evidence or something that the court missed when it was rendering its judgment. Rule 59 is similar. It's asking for a new trial or a reconsideration of the judgment due to some overlooked fact or some overlooked argument, or some improper application of the law. This is asking, this is different from an appeal, this is asking the same judge to reconsider his own judgment based on usually a clarification of a misunderstanding that may have occurred at a hearing or in the written documents. And then, of course, they're asking for leave to file the amended complaint. Now, briefly, federal courts have... Uh, been directed by the rules of civil procedure to grant broad leeway towards filing an amended complaint. If they believe an amendment can cure the deficiency, then justice would, uh, would require that that amendment be allowed. If they believe that the, uh, the deficiencies are not rectifiable by amending the complaint, basically, in this case, by clarifying the arguments are clarifying the facts for the court and pointing out how those facts actually do potentially rise to the level of what we call plausibility. Uh, not that something is merely possible, but in fact that the cause of action, the, the damages asserted, all of that are not only possible, but they are plausible outcomes from the set of facts that the court has. And therefore, we need the court to examine what happened, find facts, and conclude uh, what the actual law is. So that's what they've asked for in this complaint, and that's what, what uh, the judge basically started with as the basis for overturning his own decision. So it's important to note that in this amended complaint, the statements alleged by the plaintiff have not changed. It's the same 33 statements that were brought up in the original complaint transported over into the amended complaint. So they're not bringing in new evidence here. They're not raising new claims. They're not trying to say that Washington Post said something else about Sandman that was also defamatory. And so you really need to look at this other stuff. They're saying, no, these same 33 statements we want the court to reconsider on. The court is upholding its decision on 30 of those 33 statements. It is determined that those 30 statements, the court cannot grant relief upon those statements. However, there are three outstanding statements, uh, particularly that um, state that the plaintiff either blocked Nathan Phillips from moving or that uh, the plaintiff would not allow Nathan Phillips to retreat. The court has determined that those are factual matters that can be resolved. Did Nathan Phillips impede, or wait, sorry, did Nicholas Sandman impede Nathan Phillips' movement? 
uh, either past him or did he somehow prevent him from retreating, effectively keeping him in the same place? If they determine that those things did not occur, they then have to find out if the characterization of those statements by Washington Post caused Nicholas Sandman damage sufficient to actually award him a judgment. But that's something that comes much later. First things first, they have to find out if those statements were made, how they were made, the requisite level of uh, either negligence or malice that would require the court to intervene, and a whole bunch of other factors. But most importantly, this is about moving the case forward into discovery where you get to start resolving all of these issues, and that's a place that the Washington Post desperately doesn't want to be. So the idea is that justice requires that the discovery be had regarding these statements in their context. So they have to determine for the purposes of justice if these statements raise factual issues where if those facts turn out to be with if the statements, I, su I suppose, disagree with the facts to the level that they are false and damaging towards Sandman, that then they would require action from the court. Um, the, the first amended complaint here, uh, the court is noting that it concerns specific allegations about the state of mind of Nathan Phillips while he was making these statements. Basically, they're, they're arguing that Phillips deliberately lied concerning the events at issue. And the, Nathan Phillips isn't a Washington Post employee. So Nathan Phillips lying doesn't matter so much, except that they're alleging that he had a unsavory reputation. And of course, if you remember, there were several publications that came out in support of Nicholas Sandman as well, talking about Nathan Phillips not being an innocent old man drumming peacefully as he was characterized, but rather that Nathan Phillips has a reputation for being a rabble rouser, for being a some sort of troublemaker, for making political statements, and also they're going to allege that he has a reputation for misrepresenting what's going on. And more importantly, that the Washington Post as defendants should have been able to know about that reputation of the man while they were before they made these publications and before they relied on his statements uncritically in talking about Nicholas Sandman. Had they not been either negligent or malicious, they would have known about his reputation and been maybe more skeptical of what they were going to publish because they're because as publishers, they have editorial discretion in what goes out. So they have a duty to do some level of basic investigation uh, or at least the level that they would normally do or purport to do when reporting other stories. So they're going to argue that Washington Post failed in this duty either due to negligence or malice and didn't investigate the reputation of Nathan Phillips or knew about it and ignored it. And therefore that their statements republishing or their republication of his statements caused damage to Nicholas Sandman that otherwise would not have occurred. The next critical error that they had in their complaint, and I'm, I'm, I'm being harsh on the complaint. It, it's actually a well-drafted and very robust document. It's just a complex and convoluted legal theory because of the way that the Washington Post and other publications wrote their articles. They wrote them in a very vague manner, careful not to name Sandman specifically, but to talk about the Covington kids as a whole. However, they're alleging that the plaintiff could be identified as the subject of the publications by reason of the photographs and the videos that the publication put out. This is important. Defamatory statements have one, one very important requirement. I mean, they have several important requirements, but the very important requirement is that the person being defamed must be identifiable in the context of the defamation. So you can't just make general statements about someone, have other people, third parties, determine that they're about a specific person and apply them. Those general statements must, or uh, those statements must somehow lead to the idea that, uh, that the target is the identifiable person. They have to give some sort of detail. In this case, they're saying, well, 
they're basically arguing that, well, maybe they were talking about the Covington kids generally with their words, but combining that with pictures of Sandman's face, video of Sandman versus Phillips, they're talking specifically about Sandman, but in a vague way, right? So that's, that's the allegation, and uh, they need to... They've clarified that in the first amended complaint, and then this will also be a subject of discovery. Did they do this? Do the publications lead to this? They're going to need to get testimony from how they picked those, uh, for example, what editor chose those photos and why? Why would they choose these photos of Nicholas Sandman or the videos featuring him prominently rather than wider shots talking about the kids as a whole if they didn't intend to talk about Sandman? or if they didn't negligently do it as well. So then, of course, all of these allegations will be subject to discovery and summary judgment practice, but they do pass the requirement of plausibility. This is what I was talking about earlier. It has to be not only possible that they were defaming Nicholas Sandman, but plausible that their statements were either negligent or malicious to the point of defamation of this kid that caused him damage such that the court is required to intervene to rectify the damage. Look, the ultimate thing here is that this will proceed and go on to discovery. Discovery will allow them to depose various members of the press of Washington Post, ask them about their editorial decisions, and potentially force them to turn over their communications in regards to Nicholas Sandman, which could look really bad, right? If you've got a bunch of reporters who maybe lean towards a particular end of the political spectrum, we'll say, discussing this kid in a negative light, not only will that look bad from a PR perspective for the Washington Post, it could implicate other publications or other parties in defamatory in defamation for Nicholas Sandman and identify more people that need to be brought into the suit. But it could also simply bring out liability for the Washington Post. It might breach their their First Amendment shield and the ability to have some sort of deference that they're just innocently publishing something if you've somehow suddenly got a bunch of communications stating that, oh, look at this prick of a kid or whatever it may be. Washington Post does not want discovery in this case. And this is actually a big turn of events and, uh, and a, really a sweeping surprise if you hadn't been following the case at all, which uh, I had not. Since its dismissal, um, personally, I had I thought, well, probably like many lawyers out there, it's really hard to sue a major media publication because they've got infinite money. And more importantly, they've got that big protection of the First Amendment and a whole lot of deference from the court that they're able to say a whole lot about people so long as the they're not intentionally or I say negligently, but it's it's a really it's a really hard bar to prove negligence on behalf of a publication, especially in the eye uh, with the idea of breaking news and other things like that, where news travels very quickly. It moves fast. And and these um, these journalistic publications are expected to try and keep up with it and report on things quickly. So sometimes errors will be made. The question going forward will be, does the discovery show that those errors were unforced, that those errors were not errors, that they were negligence due to a desire to paint this kid or the situation in a particular way that ended up causing this uh, damage to this kid? And if that's the case, he could be in for a big judgment. But we'll have to wait and see. Hope you enjoyed this update. If you like these types of videos, if you like brief updates on major cases and stuff like that, please like, hit subscribe, and share the video. If you like this stuff, if you know other people who would like it, share it, get the word out. Uh, this is a big turn of events that I don't think many people saw coming, and uh, it's, it's a really interesting development in how we tackle defamation in the media. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you have a good day. Peace. Peace.